for the Sister Cities of Hope. This is a great blessing to be here with the women of Erie, Ohio, Indiana, and our first gathering, we even had people from Australia and Britain. So it's such a blessing to be here this morning and to have Robert as our speaker. I first met Robert my very first week of work here at the foundation almost 10 years ago. Father Larry calls him modern J. Job from the Bible, and you will understand this once you hear his life story. Robert is a passionate follower of Jesus. He's the youngest of eight children, born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. He studied electrical engineering and piano music in college, and he now resides in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where he is a brother, Knight of Columbus, Eucharistic minister, a lay lector, and an active member of St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Parish. He has a compelling life story to share with you today that he prays will indelibly impact your life and draw you passionately closer to Christ. I know he has already done this in my life and it is a blessing to call him a friend. So Robert, please begin. Amen. Thank you, Mary Therese. God bless all of you. Well, welcome. Good morning. It's a brisk day in Northeast Indiana and all across the country, but God is warming our hearts, and I'm honored to share this time with you. Thank you for your valuable time. The main reason I'm here to share is to point you up that you might know God, not just know about him, but know him intimately and personally. I'd like to begin our time with this prayer from Father Pedro Arupe. If we could please pray it together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in a quiet, absolute, final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. Amen. Heavenly Father, may we fall more deeply in love with you and through your Son, Jesus Christ. Our minds are open, our hearts are ready to receive all that you want to impart in us, to us, and most of all, through us, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Here we are. We come to do your will. We commit this time to you. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. I love this beautiful prayer. It really speaks to our passion. Where is your passion? What are you passionate about? Who are you living for? What are you living for? You know, I love our catechism because it makes it very plain and simple, doesn't it? Why are we here? God put us here to know him. And if you know him, you can't help but fall in love with him. And if you love him, you're going to want to serve him the rest of your life and spend eternity with him. Plain and simple, that's what life is all about, is to know God, to get this vertical relationship in order. For Jesus said a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth and not have a rich relationship with God. Do you have a rich relationship with him? Are you being transformed into his likeness? Are you being conformed into his character? Do you adopt his attitude and his actions to become more like him each and every day? For Pope St. John Paul II said about evangelization that it's not a matter of merely passing on doctrine, but rather of a personal and profound meeting with the Savior. Have you had that encounter with God Almighty? where perhaps your dormant faith suddenly came alive and active. Perhaps today will be part of that journey for you. Perhaps these last eight weeks or so being confined has been a journey down, but a journey up and more to the heart of God, going deeper in to know him. Is your faith simply passive? Do you sometimes sometimes find yourself just showing up at church and just kind of checking off your obligation? Do you just kind of get church in? Or are you getting into church? Are you passionate about the Lord? Do you love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? 
For the Bible says you must worship no other gods but only the Lord. For he is a God who is passionate about his relationship with you. He's passionate for you. Are you passionate for him? Look at your calendar. Look at your phone. Look at your bank account. You can find out real fast where your passion lies. Do you give your whole heart to him? Do you know him? Are you one with him? Because if we get this relationship right, we have a chance to get these horizontal relationships right, to live a life of no regrets with one another. And it's easy to say, but not always easy, so easy to do because we mess up. And I'm at the front of that line, trust me. <laughs> I need the cross. And that's why I make the cross out of these words. And for me, it's where I begin every morning, including very early this morning at the foot of the cross, just outside the closet. I have a cross and I get down on my knees and I just say, Lord, I need you. I surrender my life to you. And I need your grace, your strength to live this life of no regrets, to love one another, to forgive. And so very simply, that's where we invite you all today is to the cross of Jesus Christ, to lay down your anxiety, your frustrations from these past eight weeks being confined, your fears, your regrets, maybe your unforgiveness. Lay them at the foot of the cross and begin this day anew. Well, my words cannot change a life, but the words of Almighty God can. I'd like to share scripture with you today. Lamentations chapter 3 says this, The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Maybe you're feeling some of that right now. Maybe some of you have lost loved ones to the COVID-19 virus or to other losses. Maybe you just can't describe this particular time. We'll never forget this confinement. Yet the Bible says, I still dare to hope. Dare to hope. That takes radical trust in God Almighty. Could you say those three words with me, please? Dare to hope. Sometimes we need to speak it to our hearts to really sink in, to hope in God Almighty. That's why I love Father Larry and his foundation, the reason for our hope, because we always have to be ready. We must be ready to give a reason for our hope in Christ Jesus. And so I want to invite you to dare to hope, even though your situation may feel hopeless and desperate. In 2 Corinthians, the word says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. This is the Apostle Paul. And, you know, it was Jesus' idea, God's idea for them to go to Asia, and yet they still experienced trouble. And isn't that something? A lot of times when we're in God's will, we experience persecution, troubles. In fact, we were crushed and overwhelmed, he said, beyond our ability to endure. We thought we would never live through it. Do you feel that way right now? just trying to get through this time. In fact, they said, we expected to die. Some people feel that way right now with this pandemic. They were clearly in a hopeless situation, but yet they held on to hope. And as we journey through this time together, I'm gonna to share what they brought out of that experience and it's gonna help all of us. Some years ago, there were 33 miners in Chile, South America trapped 2,000 feet under the earth in a mine that had collapsed over them. They were confined. They were trapped with no way out. They were desperate and hopeless. And no one knew where they were. They were seeking help from above. In a similar way, we're seeking help from above. We feel trapped, perhaps. But somehow the people pinpointed where they were and they were able to, to send a tube down to them and send some needed supplies, food and so forth. And it took over 59 days until they finally were rescued to the surface. But that tube was their lifeline, was their hope that someone up above, someone on the surface was doing something on their behalf. Look for that tube in your life of how God's graces can come to you through prayer, through little miracles along the way, through little divine revelations of how he is doing something mighty in your life. And even though you may not always see him working, it doesn't mean he's not acting on your behalf. Always know 
that God has your best interest at heart. You can trust his heart even when you don't understand his hand. Well, my story begins with my grandparents. This lady there with the necklace on is my grandmother and to her sides are uh, her siblings. On the uh, far left is my uncle Clem. He was a uh, Je Jesuit priest in Albuquerque, New Mexico with the Navajo Indians. On the far right is my uncle Vinny, who worked in Dayton, Ohio at the university there. He's a Marianist brother and sisters Marie and Virginie. And their parents wanted them all to go into religious life. Thank God my grandmother didn't, or you'd have a different speaker today. <laughs> but God has a way of working things out. And so my parents were married in Cincinnati in 1952, and they truly lived a no regrets marriage for over 60 years. I thank God for their legacy of faith and family. And my father some time ago was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. They said, well, get your life in order. You might have just a few months to live. What do you do when you hear those words? You're going to die. We were holding on to hope that God would heal my father, or at least extend his life. We were looking for that tube, that lifeline, as it were. And we believe by the grace of God and the power of prayer, my father went on to live not just a few months, but over 39 months, over three years. And he just exemplified strength and courage through it all to us all. So I miss him very deeply. But I do thank God for their legacy of faith and family. I'm the youngest of eight children. I love big family. And uh, growing up in Cincinnati, we'd all go to church together. All 10 of us would fill an entire pew. And I called God Lord many, many times, but I hadn't yet made him Lord. There's a big difference. It's one thing to name him. It's another thing to know him. And as a teenager, I started asking all these questions. Lord, are you real? Are you there? Or what does all this mean? What am I doing at church every week? And it brought me on a journey that brought me ultimately to my knees and a point of complete surrender with reckless abandon. I said, Lord, I think I finally get it. You want my heart. You want all of me. Lord, I want all of you. Come and take over my life. I give you my life. In fact, it changed my life completely. I fell in love. I fell in love with Jesus. I fell in love with his word. See, my faith was dormant. I was sacramentalized, but I wasn't evangelized. And so I got my own personal Bible. I started reading the Bible every day. And to this day, I still read it every single day. I memorize scriptures and I encourage you, read this book every single day. Don't just try. Did you try to eat yesterday? Well, don't feed your body and starve your soul. In fact, his father, Larry, challenges so many of us. He says, no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. That means when you wake up in the morning, don't run to the iPhone, run to thy throne. Don't run to the TV, run to the Almighty. Don't run to Facebook or social media, run to the good book first. Run to him. At the end of the day, read some more scriptures. Embrace your day with the good news of Jesus Christ. There's enough bad news for the rest of the day. At least start and end your day with good news. In fact, St. Jerome in, in our catechism says that ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. If you want to fall in love with God Almighty, fall in love with his word, you'll fall in love with Jesus. Jesus is the word incarnate. In fact, even when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by the devil himself, what did he use? The word of God. He said, it is written. If the living word needed the written word, to defeat the enemy of the word, how much more do we? In fact, this is very scriptural. Very first chapter of Joshua says to meditate on it day and night. The very first Psalm says study it day and night. No Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. You'll never regret it. And so I grew up there in Cincinnati. I studied piano as a youngster at the conservatory of music. I went on a study here in Indiana for a few years in college. And while I do like to play, I also do occasionally like to eat. And so I transferred back to Cincinnati to study electrical engineering. And part of my curriculum brought me all the way to Boston, Massachusetts as a co-op student, where I was helping to design computer chips during the day at a high-tech company. Well, on evenings and weekends, I got a job in downtown Boston playing the piano at a sidewalk cafe back when I thought having that hairdo would be really cool. Now, not so much. I pray they never come back. But thankfully, that doozy of a hairdo didn't deter a beautiful blonde from Kansas from coming down, just plopping down on the piano bench next to me. 
That never happened to me. I'm kind of a geeky, nerdy engineering type. I didn't date a whole lot. I didn't know what to say. I was shaking in my boots, just trying to keep my fingers on the right notes. But suddenly we just started talking together. The words just started flowing. We started laughing together. She kept on laughing, probably because she kept on looking at my hair. But you know, it had to be a divine appointment. How else could you get a city slicker from Cincinnati, a country girl from Kansas, in the middle of downtown Boston? That would be God. And our Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, if you seek him first, he'll give you everything that you need, right? That's why no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. Don't seek the person, the promotion, the prestige, the position, whatever it might be. Seek God. Seek his presence. And lo and behold, a divine appointment when he least suspected. Of course, it didn't hurt that Melissa reached into her purse, put out a $5 bill, and put in a tip cup you see on the piano there. She, after then, she said, boy, that's the best five bucks that I ever spent. And so we quickly fell in love over an ice cream sundae. I thought, you know, better marry this girl. So on a romantic riverboat cruise back in Cincinnati on New Year's Eve, I popped the question. She said yes right there with the ring on her finger. And one year later, we married in Cincinnati on New Year's Eve. And she said, I do, even though I still had that mullet. After seven long years of college, I finally graduated with one degree and one job offer. It was from California. So I took it and we packed up and moved west and started our lives together. And we always wanted a big family. And God bless us with many children, but none ever came easily. Our first we named McCann. She was over two weeks late, took over two long days of tough labor and delivery to get here, followed by a C-section because she was nine pounds, 11 ounces, 22 inches long and upside down. After all that, somehow Melissa still said, it's okay, she's worth it. Yes, indeed, she is worth it. McKenna came to me one Saturday morning. She said, Daddy, can we build that birdhouse? I'd had the wood, I had the instructions, I just hadn't gotten around to it. I looked at my list of things I wanted to do that day. You know, we feel good about checking things off the list. And I looked at my list and looked at our daughter and kind of hesitated and said, okay, McKenna, let's build the birdhouse. So I put down my agenda, picked up the saw, we cut the wood and put it together. She got out her colors and crayons and made a little welcome sign you see there and a little arrow at the top so the birds would know right where to go for the food. And we made a birdhouse, but more importantly, we made a memory. Take time to make memories with your loved ones. You can always make more money. There's always gonna be more messages. You can't always make more memories. When she was about a year old, I had to rush Melissa to the hospital. We had no idea what was happening. Turned out she was pregnant. Apparently the baby had lodged in one of her tubes and exploded. It was an ectopic rupture. Had I gone to work early that morning, I would have come home to a dead wife. Do you trust God in those moments of life when you just hit rock bottom in an instant and you're left holding on to hope where it feels like you're walking out on a limb and the only thing you got to hold on to is your faith. We need hope to cope at times like that. And now with half of Melissa's reproductive organs gone, we thought, how are we gonna have a big family? But God is still God and we are not. Either we trust him or we don't. Well, lo and behold, within about half a year, we found out we were expecting again. After five years of California, we'd had enough. We wanted to move to the Midwest, be closer to family. And so we moved to Kansas City where we bought our very first home. And a few months later, gave birth to our very first boy. We named him Zachary, an eight pound whopper, born completely naturally, no complications. Boy, we were thrilled. Until the next day when the doctors came and said, we believe your son has Down syndrome. Bam, that was like a baseball bat to my gut. I was buckled to my knees saying, Lord, I don't know how to do this. How do we raise a child with special needs? How do we deal with his autism, his colostomy bag, his cleft palate, teach him sign language to communicate, all these challenges but all these blessings. We were quickly realize that disability really is an opportunity to grow closer to God and closer to one another. We learned a lot of great things. We also learned don't ever feed your boy an entire bucket of blueberries. Or he may say to you too, mom and dad, do I ever have a diaper for you? I know because I changed it and I'll never forget it. <laughs> A couple of years later, we gave birth to another little big guy, another nine pound whopper, another day and a half of tough labor and delivery, another C-section, but another miracle. We named him Nicholas. And then for our 10th wedding anniversary, Melissa said, we're gonna have another baby. We were thrilled to have number four on the way, but 
two weeks later, we miscarried again. Boy, it's devastating when it's part of your heart, part of your flesh, part of you. Perhaps some of you know what that feels like to lose a child before birth. Perhaps you've lost a child after birth or full-grown child. Perhaps your child is wayward. You don't know where they are, where their faith is. We all have losses in life. Maybe you've lost your whole family through what I've heard called the living death of divorce. How your heart must bleed every single day. I cannot begin to imagine. There's thousands of ways to be hurt. There's only one way to be healed. This is where our hope lies, is in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so we offered up our pain to God, said, Lord, we just want a big family. Why is that so difficult? Well, then we just receive a little unction in our hearts, just a prompting, adopt. Just a little unction, adopt. And so we just went for it. We went to an innocent informational meeting there in Kansas City at an agency with these tears rolling down our cheeks. We knew this is for us. Long story short, 11 months later, we're on a 747 airplane flying from San Francisco, California to Beijing, China, because we heard about a little orphan girl that nobody else wanted, all because she wasn't perfect, all due to a heart defect. We thought, well, we have a special needs boy. Let's go get a special needs girl. She's perfect for us. So I'll never forget coming back to the Kansas City airport and crossing that jetway to greet the rest of our family and holding in our arms this beautiful bundle of joy. We thought, oh, how can nobody want her? She's perfect. She's beautiful. She's spicy. And yet there's at least 143 million orphans on this planet right now. It's up to us as a body of Christ to care for them in some way. We thought, well, we got to start with just one. So right away, she was just part of her family, one of the gang. Of course, we could never quite make all four smile at once. You know how it is sometimes? You get out the cookies, the toys, you try to sing a song. It doesn't always work, right? Life is not perfect, but life is precious. And we learn particularly by having two special needs children how life is sacred. I implore each of your parents and grandparents, love your children with all you've got. Don't let a day go by without letting them know how much you love them. Tell them you love them. Use the words to live a life of no regrets. Forgive one another. Love one another. The Bible in Romans chapter 5 says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Everybody smile. Woohoo! <laughs> Maybe right now you don't quite feel like rejoicing. <laughs> and yet, God has a purpose through that trial to conform us into the image of his son, to develop something through us. Why? For we know that they help us develop endurance. And then endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. Hold on to hope. God won't let you down. It may seem like you're trapped, like the world's caved in above you, like those 33 miners. But God has you in the palm of his hands. And sometimes even when he delays or answers differently than we had asked, it's because he has something better in mind. Kansas Saturday night. Four young children were killed in one car. The rising waters trapped the family's minivan against a highway barrier until it broke, plunging the vehicle into a creek three stories below. Robert Rogers, who two weeks ago lost his wife and all four of his small children in a raging flash flood across Kansas Highway. yourself again and again, why was I left here? Why was I spared? Well, I believe it was nothing short of a miracle. Um, God is not a taker of life. God loved the world so much that he gave. I believe he 
chose to spare me so that I might be a beacon of hope, uh, a banner for families, so that um, we might reach others through this experience and help them to cherish their children and families. Hug and kiss them every day, every morning and every evening. Tell them over and over how much you love them. Snuggle with them at bedtime. Place your hand on their heads and bless them every day as I did. No hug is unimportant. A very moving, a very moving soliloquy yesterday from a father who has lost so much. The sea you shall not drown. Know that I am with you through it all. Be not afraid. I go before you always. Come, follow me. And I will give you rest. Do you believe that? Really deep down here, just words of a beautiful song that I've sung since my childhood. But truly the essence of our faith, that even if the worst happens, he is still with you. Be not afraid. I could not possibly share before you right now, if it weren't my faith. Now, my faith didn't just evaporate or take away the pain. It still hurts. I still cry. I still grieve. I still look up at the stars and whisper their names and blow them a kiss. I still trust God. My faith that was with me that night when all six of us in our vehicle were washed off the Kansas turnpike by a seven foot wall of water and plunged into this deluge. Somehow I was washed ashore and they took me by ambulance to a nearby hospital in Emporia, Kansas, while they began a search and rescue for my family. In the middle of the night, an officer and a chaplain came to my room somberly with their hats on their chest. They said, Robert, we found your minivans. It was upside down a mile and a half from the freeway. I said, Robert, three of your young children were still in their car seats, and they are dead. And Robert, we need to ask you to identify their bodies. What do you do? It's every parent's worst nightmare. All my blood just went to my toes. I felt numb. At first, I couldn't even cry. They took me down this long hallway to the emergency room pulled back the drape, and there before me was Zachary. He was five years old, a little big guy with Down syndrome. Nicholas, our buddy boy, three years old. Aline, our precious sweet pea from China, still only one year old. We only had her for eight short months. We never got to celebrate our birthday or Christmas together. And suddenly the floodgates of all my tears just burst forth, and I collapsed over each of their bodies and stroked their wet hair and cried and groaned and wailed from my gut like I was going to throw up again. And somehow I believe only by the Holy Spirit, with one hand on each of their chests, I raised my other hand up to heaven. I said, Lord, into your hands I commend their spirits. The very words of Jesus on the cross as he breathed his last, exemplifying his lifetime of surrender. And so must we. It's one of the hardest things to do as followers of Christ, isn't it? Is to surrender. <laughs> Even now during this pandemic, to surrender our mobility, to surrender our will, to surrender everything. And yet we must follow him and surrender by following his footsteps. A few hours later, they came to my room again and said, we found McKenna. She'd apparently caught on a barbed wire fence just a short distance from her minivan. I had to go down a long hallway once again, identify daddy's first little girl. She just turned eight years old only two weeks before. We had a great party and everything. And for days we prayed and hoped they would somehow find Melissa okay. On the third day, they found her body two miles from the freeway, this retention pond. 
that had tripled in size from all the floodwaters. I had to identify my wife of over 11 years. Where do you go? Where do you run? What holds you up at a time like that? It can only be the power of God and his mighty word. He who holds the planets in orbit can hold our life and our world together when it all comes crashing down. That's how we hold on to hope. For me, I ran to the Psalms. I love the Psalms. I said, why am I so discouraged? Why my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. It takes a radical act of trust to put your hope in God when you don't feel like it. But it's not based on feelings. It's based on trust, free falling into the arms of Jesus. Hope is joyful expectation about the future. Trusting that God somehow can turn everything together around for good. And he began bringing little bits of good through our horrible tragedy. People whose lives were transformed. They told me later, Robert, you helped me put my whole trust in Christ Jesus. And we'd believe in the wreckage of our minivan, he uncovered our camera. We'd use that night to the wedding and the reception. You can see some of the candles and things and a table behind us. It's a miracle they even found our camera. It's another miracle they were able to develop a roll of film in that camera. But the biggest miracle of all is that all four of our children are actually looking at the camera at once and smiling. That virtually never happens, right? <laughs> I have a picture on a beautiful blue bookmark that I'd be glad to share with you or send to you if you want to be in touch with me. Uh, just so you can see a miracle and perhaps share it with someone else who needs some hope. First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. We grieve, yes. The tears don't go away. There's always a hole in our hearts. But we grieve with hope. That's how we hold on to hope. Because our ability to cope with the present is intimately tied to our view of the future, our perspective of the future. And if we can see the future through eternity's lens, and we know that our loved ones are waiting for us, or whatever devastating experience you go through on this earth, that God has a new chapter, has something better down the road. He calls us to be joyful in that hope. <clears throat> Excuse me. Be joyful in hope patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Now, that's just not a fake facade we paint on our face, but joy is an inner calm and peace, despite the storm swirling around us. Those 33 miners that were trapped for 59 days said there weren't 33 of us, there were 34. God was with us. They were joyful in hope. That tube sent, us, sent them little life flies along the way, little glimmers of hope until one day they were finally rescued. How do we do it? We all know it, but do we do it? The Bible says, trust me. Trust me in your times of trouble. And God says, I'll do two things. I love this. I will rescue you. I will. Some way, somehow, I'll rescue you. He rescued my family that night. They got to go to heaven. Who's more blessed? Better is one day in its courts than a thousand anywhere else. I felt as if we were all going to heaven. I was tumbling in the water. I couldn't see. I couldn't breathe. I was ingesting the floodwaters. I was drowning. I was dying. It felt as if God had his hand around all six of us, lifting us up to heaven. But somehow I was washed ashore. I don't know how. But it's only by the sheer grace of God that we can communicate and be together this beautiful Saturday, May 9, 2020. This is God's doing. God is God, and we are not. Either we trust him or we don't. I will rescue you. Now, it may not be your way. It may not be your timing, but it'll be God's way. It's going to be good. That's number one. Number two, he says, and, and you will give me glory. What? Wait a minute, Lord. Glory? You sure you used the right word there, God? Have you seen my life lately, Lord? I'm a mess. I'm a wreck. How are you going to bring glory out of this? But you know, out of your mess, God can bring forth a message. 
God can take the good, the bad, and the ugly and turn it into your divine destiny. It's called a miracle. Out of every great test can come a great testimony. The key is how we respond. And so I just did my best to respond in faith. I tried to go back to my engineering career and it just seemed pointless. And so many people started inviting me to come to their church and their school and their organization to just share some words of hope, how I held on to hope. I'd never done this before. I'm a shy, reserved introvert. I've usually just been comfortable behind a piano or a keyboard or a computer screen, but not in front of people, not in front of a camera. <laughs> but God often uses our weakness to display his strength. That's how, that's how you know it's him and not me. I started traveling around the world to places like Haiti and Russia and India after the tsunami when hundreds of thousands lost their loved ones in turbulent waters. And if I can offer one word that's helped me to heal the most these past years, it's just one word, serve. Serve, it sounds kind of backwards, doesn't it? When I'm in pain, I need others to pour into me. But what I found is you empty your life and pour into others, God will fill you up. It's in giving that you receive. You're going to reap what you sow. The prayer of St. Francis, right? What I found is that you look into the eyes of those you serve and they, you see their heart. It'll help change your heart and transform your heart to become more like Jesus. Through my passion for these orphans, I began a foundation I call the Mighty in the Land foundation with a big vision to sponsor began at least five orphanages around the world and honor my five heavenly family members and one by one god's been bringing that vision to pass in 2006 we dedicated the first one to russia and called it the melissa home then in rwanda the mckenna home in india the zachary village in uganda the nicholas home in downtown beijing china alina's home back in uganda hope village in haiti joy village in Kingston, Jamaica, with the missionaries of the poor, the Bethlehem home. In fact, since we began this foundation, we've given or granted over $536,000 to help care for orphans and special needs children around the world, including here in the United States as well. Now, I can understand a lot of numbers, but I cannot understand those numbers. They're way over my head. I'm not capable. It has nothing at all to do with me. It has everything to do with God. But look what God can do. If you give him your sorrows, offer up your suffering, ask him to transform it, bless it, multiply it, and make it good. And he can and he will. Oh, he's so rich. He's so good. I'm so honored to be a part of their lives. I've also been honored to have partnered with Focus on the Family. As I literally scraped out the walls of my heart and put them on the pages of his book called Into the Deep. Into the Deep, one man's story of how tragedy took his family but could not take his faith. I may have lost my family, but I didn't lose my faith, my joy, my hope. And this book tells how. A lot of people have read it in a few hours. They told me later, Robert, I couldn't put it down. It's helped change the way I live my life. And do you know why? Not because of me, but because of him. And because I filled this book with this book. It's full of scripture. That's really what will change your life. If you need one of these, you just thought of somebody who would need one. They're available on my website. And they're available to anybody for anything. So here's my pledge to you. If you need it, you can't afford it, you go ahead and just contact me and I'll get one to you, okay? They're also available for a reason for our HOPE website. We'll be glad to get one to you some way, somehow. There's also a Spanish version available if that's helpful to someone. After my family died, into the camera, I said these words, I have no regrets. Not because of a perfect life, but we lived a purposeful life. That day my family died, I'd hugged them all. I told them, I loved them, our hearts were clear. And so many people said, Robert, how'd you come to live that life of no regrets? And so it just prompted me to put down words in another book I call Seven Steps to No Regrets. Just seven key principles of living a life of no regrets with God and with one another. It's full of scriptures that'll help steer your life in the right direction and full of stories of all that God has done since the flood. Father Larry Richards endorsed this book and I pray it'd be a blessing to you. Just let me know if you need it. And we're all going through a test right now. And so people just kept asking me, Robert, how do you get through the test? And so I wrote a book called Pass a Test, How to Endure the Fire of Affliction and Emerge Like Gold. It's a thin book, only about 100 pages, a quick read. But it's full of over 200 scriptures that I pray will help you. Then lastly, I wrote a book called Rise Above. Rise Above. How to Heal the Hurts and Overcome the Worst. 
because when you're that one going through the valley, it's the worst. And so if these are available to you, please let me know. There's some music CDs on the website. I'd be glad to get them to you. There's also a video that followed Larry recorded and that's available on Reason for Our Hope. Because I do this full time. I mean, this is what I do. Why? Why share this difficult message even one more time? Well, for one, because Mary Therese invited me to come and to share. <laughs> and he's passed 16 years, over 1,300 places of people have invited me. And each time I share, it's excruciatingly difficult. It traumatizes me because I don't just tell the story. I relive the story. But I do so to bear witness to the power of good, the power of God to transform suffering into glory, to give voice to the triumph of goodness and courage beyond the grave, to bear witness to how good and how short and how precious life is and how every single moment and decision matters, of how this time with you matters. I believe I live to help extend the blessings of God through our horror to you, that your life might come alive today. I want to help turn people's hearts towards God and turn parents and children's hearts back to one another. My testimonies cost me everything. I charge nothing. I come in complete faith whenever I share. I want to help challenge others to live a life of no regrets. But I could use your help. Could you help me in just two simple ways? Number one, if this story has impacted your heart and you saw it of your parish, another parish, or any church across the country, even any denomination, just get in touch with me through the website or I'll be glad to send you a brochure if that's helpful or through uh, Facebook and Twitter that other people might encounter Jesus. That's my heart's desire is for people to experience Christ through our family story. So just spread the word. That's number one. Number two is most important, pray. Can you please pray, please pray for me? I need your prayers. Don't we all? If you'd like to commit to pray, could you pray this one time a month? What's your birthday? Just pray on that day each month, just 12 times a year. There's a spot on my website if you'd like to just sign up to pray and commit to pray. And if you do, I'll be glad to ship you one of these green wristbands, which has my motto on it, to know God and live a life of no regrets. It's a reminder for you to pray, but it's more for you. A reminder to know God more each and every day and to live a life of no regrets. It's a reminder of no Bible, no breakfast, no Bible, no bed. It's a reminder that if your child comes to you and says, Mommy or Daddy, can we do that thing we've been putting off for so long? That you do put down your phone, your agenda. You look at them eyeball to eyeball and say, yeah, you know what? Let's do it right now. Let's not wait another moment. Because this picture with McKenna was taken July 12, 2003. Seven weeks later, McKenna was dead. And I thank God that a guy like me just happened to make a no regrets decision that Saturday morning and build a simple little birdhouse with my daughter. I still have that birdhouse now in my backyard here in Indiana. I still cherish that memory in my heart. Today counts. Pope Francis said, accept every day as a gift from God. Live it to the fullest. Love it to the fullest. We must hold on to the hope of Christ because he is our hope. Remember this scripture we began with, with St. Paul, that they were crushed and overwhelmed beyond their ability to endure. They thought they would never live through it. And in fact, they expected to die. And so what happened? As a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. Haven't we been learning that these past eight weeks, especially? Not to rely on sell ourselves, but to drop to our knees when prayer is our only option. And to rely on God who raises the dead. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us. That's how we hold on to hope. That's why there is hope. Christ is in us, our hope of glory. Thanks be to God. Against all hope, even Abraham believed without weakening in his faith. He didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God. What did he do? He was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded 
that God had the power to perform what he had promised. Be like Abraham. This is one of the best descriptions of faith in the Bible, is that even though we don't see it, we trust God for the answer, that he can fulfill what he has promised. For Lord, you've allowed me to suffer much hardship. Psalm 71. Couldn't we probably all agree with that? Yes, Lord, you've allowed me to suffer a lot of tough stuff, but I love this. You will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. Isn't that good news? That's what the resurrection is all about, how God reached down, lifted up his own son. And because he lives within us, he wants to lift you up too. He's done it all through time, all through scripture. Usually when it's darkest, boom, that's when light and hope come bursting through. That's when light dawns for the upright. Morning's coming. It's always darkest right before the morning. Remember Job, who had everything and he lost everything? His business, his health, all 10 of his children. But he didn't give up. He held on to that hope in God. He said, even though he slays me, yet will I trust him. Yet will I hope in him. But that's not the end of the story. At the end of the book of Job, God blessed him with double of everything, including double the family. He had 10 children in heaven. He got 10 more children on this earth, seven boys, three girls, much like before. And the Bible says that from Job's experience, we see how the Lord's plan finally ended in good. Don't you love that? Don't you love a good book, a good story with a happy ending? I do. God is a God of happy ending. Heaven ultimately, but even the seasons and chapters of your life on this planet, you have good endings if you trust him, if you hold on to hope in him. Can I prove it to you? Look at this next picture. 14 years ago this month, May 20th, a beautiful girl said to a guy like me, I do. Her name is Inga. She's not from Sweden. She's from Indiana. So now I'm a Hoosier. <laughs> and thereafter, God blesses with a beautiful son. We named him Ezekiel Thomas. And then God blesses with a gorgeous daughter. We named her Estella Eve. And after a very traumatic miscarriage, a little stillborn baby boy, about five inches long, five months long, we held him in our hands. I had to bury him. It was awful. But then God blesses us with a marvelous son. We named him Leo George. And another time he blesses us with a gorgeous daughter. We named Lola Elizabeth. Behold the hand of Almighty God. Is anything impossible with God? Nothing's impossible with God. You see, in 2003, my beautiful wife and two mighty sons and two lovely daughters died in that flash flood in Kansas. Now somehow God has graced me with a beautiful wife and two mighty sons and two lovely daughters. How is that possible? But by the sheer grace of Almighty God, is it no wonder my knees hit the floor every morning? I assure you they do, because I don't deserve them. I'm nothing. I'm just dust and ashes. But because I know God through his son, Jesus Christ, he calls me son. Look how much he loves me. Look how much he loves you. He gave his only son that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God loves you. There's nothing you can do to stop his love for you. Would you receive his love? Receive that lifeline. Hold on to that hope of Christ. I love my family beyond what words can express. I cannot wait to hop downstairs and squeeze the cheese out of them because today is actually my birthday. And so they're working on a cake for me right now. <laughs> so I can't wait to just enjoy one another's presence. But we have a very loud and active home. I work out of my home office. We home educate our children. Our, ages, our children are ages 12 and under. But it's become more active and loud lately because not too long ago, we found out we're expecting again. And so a short time ago, God bless us with another son. We named him Solomon. Gideon Rogers. He's already 20 months old. It's hard to believe. Behold what God can do. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who trust in him. And by the way, we can't always get our children to look at the camera once and smile either. So thank God we can laugh. Well, let me wrap it up with one last image of God's amazing attention to detail in our lives, because God truly is in the details of life. See, after my family died, I had to bury all five of them at once. They're in Kansas City. There's hardly any words even to try to describe that. But there at the cemetery in Kansas City after the burial, 
I had these balloons. I just felt compelled to release them up to heaven one by one, but I didn't quite want to let them pluck out of my fingers. But one by one, they arose, and it was a beautiful sight and an awful sight all at once. We came back to my empty, hollow home. I lived there for nearly three years alone. It took a long time to go through all their belongings and everything. Many nights, I would just curl up into a little ball in the fetal position in my children's beds and cry myself to sleep. I was holding on to hope. But on that first day back with my parents, my siblings at my side, we're just clinging to each other for dear life. We just happened to wander into our laundry room of all places. On the wall was this calendar my Dr. McKenna had made as a school project a full year before the flood. It was still on August, but now it was September 6th, the day of the funeral. And so we flipped the calendar up and our jaws hit the floor. Because there's McKenna going to heaven. She never drew herself in any of the 12 months except this one. She's holding balloons. I just released balloons at the cemetery. She's holding six balloons. Six people died that night of the flood. She, had a, she has a big smile on her face. Her feet are off the ground. There's a woman driving the bus. Melissa was driving her van that night when we hit the floodwaters. There's two boys and a girl still in their car seats on the bus. Our two sons and youngest daughter were still in their car seats when they found them in the wreckage of a minivan. And if you notice, I'm nowhere in a picture. It's just the five of them. And off to the right is a stoplight she colored red, as if that's the end. Well, if that's not enough, remember that last rule of film that miraculously uncovered from the wreckage of her minivan developed? They also came out with this picture we'd snapped after the bride and groom left the reception. And all the balloons from the car were on a pavement, and of course our kids were playing with them. And lo and behold, there's McKenna in virtually the same exact pose as she drew a year before. This has taken hours before we hit the flash flood. But look, her arms are up to heaven, balloons in each hand. She's got a big smile on her face. Her feet are off the ground. And to see what's right behind her, there's that stoplight, just like in her picture. You put those two next to each other, and friends, this is no coincidence. This is a God incident. This is real. God is real. This book, it's real. It's not just a bunch of stories. You can live your life by it. In fact, there's one big love letter from God to you. He's passionate about his relationship with you. Heaven is real and hell is real and you will spend eternity in one of those two places. And that's the main reason I come today. It's to make sure we don't miss it. To make sure we don't hear, depart from me. I never knew you. But rather that we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Do you know him? Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even though he dies. Then he asked her, do you believe this? That's the key question. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is God and he is the resurrection? I'd like to share one song with you as we conclude, one I compose for my daughter McKenna, from a father's heart. Because so I had a lot of questions, you know. Lord, why? Why did I live and they died? I don't get it. I'm their protector, I'm their provider. But I was so comforted when I realized their last breath on earth was followed immediately by their first breath in heaven. You taught me what it's like to be a daddy. To be invincible in your eyes. You taught me what it's like to be the king of our castle and whisk my little princess away. But what was it like to break the bonds of death into life? And what was it like to breathe in your last breath and not die? What was it like to pierce the earthly veil 
to heaven can you teach me somehow what is heaven like you taught me what it's like to be your hero to feel your whole hand wrapped around my finger you taught me what it's like to kiss my princess goodnight but when the rain came i couldn't save your life mckenna what was it like to break the bonds of death into life and what was it like to breathe in your last breath and still not die what was it like to pierce the earthly veil to heaven can you teach me somehow what is heaven to dance on streets of gold and what is it like to savor heaven's ice cream and what is it like to hold jesus and just gaze in his eyes What was it like to pierce the earthly veil to heaven? Can you teach me somehow? Can you show me somehow? Darling, teach me somehow. What is heaven like? Just like that. Life can change in an instant. We just don't know, do we? Every death, every funeral reminds us just how thin the veil is between this world and the next, between time and eternity, between this opportunity for conversion, that moment of judgment. So I pray that none of us leaves this time together unchanged, but rather that we allow this encounter with eternity to change us, to transform us, to turn us away from sin and back to the Lord to turn us away from the world and all its attractions and back to our families. I love that message they left on my phone just two weeks before the flood. I just happened to save it. But did you notice they never said goodbye? They just said, good night, Daddy. I love you. And that's the truth. Because when we're in Christ, there is no goodbye. It's just good night. Yes, weeping indoors for the night, we cry a lot of tears, but joy comes. Joy comes in the morning because God is faithful. He says, I will be faithful to you, and you will finally know me as Lord. Do you know him as Lord? Lord, over every corner and crevice of your life, if today were your last day, would you have no regrets? Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this most blessed time together today. We've been touched by your Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. Right now we surrender. We surrender our hearts, our wills, our very lives to you. And we say, come in. Come into our hearts, Lord God. Transform us. Do within us what you must. So you can do through us what you will. And fill us with your hope, Jesus. Hope everlasting. Christ, our hope of glory. That as we go forth now, that we would know you, love you, serve you, and follow you all of our days with all of our might. We pray these things through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Why? So that you may overflow with hope. Hold on to hope. Thank you for allowing me to share with you today. God bless you. Thank you, Robert, and happy birthday. May you have a blessed day with your family. Even though I've heard this talk so many times before, it still, it still gets to my heart, too. You just have an amazing testimony. And I encourage everyone to visit Robert's website at Mighty in the Land Ministry. We have his website and the resources on the Sister of Cities uh, website. And during this time when all speaking events are canceled for Robert, you can help support his ministry by purchasing one of his beautiful books or making a donation. I know that um, also we, you may have seen on the City Sisters of Hope, there's a wall of hope, which is takes you back to the reason for our hope who sponsors these events. And we welcome you to post a prayer request there or a message of hope in this time. You know, we really, really need to see some great inspiration like Robert gave to us today. Um, it's just truly, truly inspiring hope beyond what anyone could ever imagine. So I want to let you know that um, we also pray for these prayer requests in our Adoration Chapel 24 seven. So please consider visiting our Wall of Hope and um, we're so happy that we can connect with all of you. And I thank Robert once again for being here today and thank you all for being here and please consider sharing um, Robert's testimony and this webinar with your family and friends. It'll be posted on the Reason for Our Hope um, and also on the Sister Cities of Hope website and the 138 Women, as well as the Mighty in the Land website. And his website will be under um, his talk when it's posted to the Sister Cities of Hope. So Robert, may you continue to bring hope to so many others. I know that every time I hear it, it goes right to my heart, even though I know what's coming. <laughs> it's just amazing. So I, um, I thank you for being here. I hope you have a wonderful uh -huh. birthday with your family. And um, Grace God. and we uh, look forward to, to keeping in touch with you. And for those of you on this uh, webinar, we have two survey questions. If you could just stay on and answer them. They're just very quick questions. Um, about the future of the, the, the webinars that we do. So, Robert, thank you again. You're welcome. May thank God you, bless you and your ministry always. You. And thank you, yeah. everyone, for coming today.